One thing I like to do when doing any of my videos is reference other material, other things that can quite reasonably demonstrate my point. For example, when I did the when I did one of my reels runs, I don't know if that's come out yet. They're sort of on a separate time scale to what I'm doing now. The reels run was referencing the video by Kotzkazag on a theory some scientists have that life originated before Earth. So I used that to reference what it was on about. At least what I was on about when I, when I mentioned it. But it's also an interesting point because it gives the idea that life and therefore God was there before Earth was. It's an interesting thought experiment, if nothing else. But does that mean I'm doing my research properly? Not necessarily, I'll admit that quite freely. I'm not the most scholarly of people. Need to readjust that slightly. Yeah, maybe doing a lot of shifting of camera. It's pretty dangerous when I'm driving, I'll be honest, but still. However, I try and find the most neutral point possible. Which is what brought me to the channel Metatron. I don't know the uh, actual name of the chap who runs the channel. But he's a, uh, he's a member of Game Night which is a uh, group run of coming together of uh, various historical minds, including Jason, I think his name is Jason Kingsley, of Modern History TV, uh, Lindy Beige, and Shadowversity. But one of his videos that I'm mentioning here was in response to a series of videos he did basically talking about basically talking about God and various other things to do with God. This certainly made me rather interested because his his point of view seemed fairly Fairly balanced, fairly moderated. I'm at traffic lights here, so it should be okay. Hopefully that will be uh, balanced enough, I don't know. But... I thought, is he coming from a perspective of Christianity or atheism? I'm asking that because... If it comes from an angle of atheism, and he seems fairly towards the idea of God, then he's used then that scholarly and developing good ideas based on information he's picked up and studied. getting a true neutral position on it. The same would be true if the opposite was true. If, if he was coming at it from a Christian perspective and finding things against the Christian narrative. That is important. Because if the opposite is proven by someone trying to find find the main, if it were, then the information is valid and generally able to stand up to scrutiny. 
Does it make it infallible? Not really. So, when I saw his video, basically saying, am I religious? I decided to check it out. I was surprised to see that he was, in fact, deeply Christian, and whilst he never mentioned his denomination, it doesn't really matter. But he did mention two things, or two instances, where he was happy confirming his faith by them. Well, he mentioned three of them, really, but the third one he put in a separate video, which I've deliberately not watched yet, because I'll end up referencing them, and he made very clear this is a very sacred thing to him, and one that he has no wish to make any money of. Likewise, out of respect for him, I'm not going to steal his video purely to push my point. I'll reference it, so if you want to see it, you can. But I'm not going to mention it here. But so far, the two that he mentioned, two instances he mentioned, were inexplicable and could only be explained spiritually. He could say it was by eyewitness testimony or personal experience. Things that many people will say are unscientific and therefore not conducive to a solid evidence that we can base belief on. As a pragmatic person, I agree with that somewhat. But I don't think that totally invalidates spiritual experiences. Not in the slightest. Neil deGrasse Tyson, a uh, physicist, who a great following and someone I respect greatly, he said that eyewitness testimony is the lowest form of evidence in science, but the highest form of evidence in a courtroom. Whilst I'm willing to accept that, I will say that that's purely because of human error. And that's actually something that crops up in two more areas of science. And technically, eyewitness testimony is just another way of saying observation. Scientific observation, maybe. For example, say, I see a, I'm doing chemistry for example, and I see that when I put something containing potassium in a flame, it produces a pinkish flame. I got rather annoyed during my uh, A-level chemistry that when I put down what I actually observed, which was pinky orange, they said, no, no, it should be lilac. And I was like, I saw pinky orange. It still got to the same conclusion, because it's nearer to uh, lilac than anything else. But that's what I actually saw. Does that invalidate my testing? No. Because I drew the same conclusion. Just because I called it something different means very little. Chemistry is one thing. Biology is another. Our personal experience is how we treat symptoms. There are signs that we can see in a patient and there are symptoms that we can express.
something that we experience. More often than not, if we just tell the doctor our symptoms, they can run the appropriate tests, and that will show more symptoms that they can actually diagnose and therefore give us an actual diagnosis, rather than look up what our symptoms suggest on the internet. I've done that before. So, why does Neil deGrasse Tyson say that eyewitness testing, which is just another name for observation really, is so invalid in science? Why do people degrade on the earliest forms of scientific evidence as scientifically invalid these days. Well, according to Neil, it's because now we've got instruments. In fact, apparently, all science was completely useless until we found instruments that read things differently. The images he showed were for telescopes, which I think is rather ridiculous, because Yes, our sight is limited and we can't see stars too far away. And we can't see what the We can't see what the what the smallest things on Earth looks like. That clearly. But we can still see a lot. In fact, Isaac Newton saw that there were that light was a spectrum simply by putting something in the way of a light beam and hence creating the rainbow as we know it, or at least seeing the rainbow as we know it, thus showing that the rainbow wasn't something necessarily divine, but it was certainly something to do with light acting through different mediums. He saw how light became a spectrum, and we just built on that when we understood the electromagnetic spectrum, only a small part of which we can see. I will admit, our human experience is drastically limited by what we can take in. As I said, we've only got a narrow band of light that we can see in the electromagnetic spectrum. In our auditory range, we've only got something, or something about about a hundred or a thousand hertz, some of that. So a very narrow range of sounds that can go from so low it practically shakes the earth to so high that it can shatter glass. So what about our other senses? Well, we've got our sense of smell. That will tell us only a few things. It won't tell us exactly what the chemicals is. And in fact, it's a mixture of hydrogen and sulphur that will give us the uh, brimstone smell that we associate with rotten eggs and even volcanoes. Namely, a source of danger. And our, and our olfactory sense of taste. That's something interesting as well, because we were believed to basically guide us to the foods that will give us certain nutrients. The umami, the savoury flavours that will give us the uh, protein, the carbohydrates and the fats. The salty flavours, those are the ones that will give us certain minerals. The sweet flavours, that is the sugar that we need for energy. And sour is believed to actually be a result of us needing vitamin C. So we learn to taste sour and recognise that's where we get vitamin C from. That's why we find oranges, lemons, limes, those sort of bitter fruits, sour. So,
What else do we have? A tactile sense? I mean, that will also give us a sense of heat, which can get played on with various chemicals like capsaicin, hence we get the spicy flavours, which isn't actually a flavour, it's literally our tongues yelling HOT! Interesting enough, as I was saying, our view, our vision is limited, especially if we're not looking, and someone nearly cut me up at the roundabout there. Did you see that? No, because the camera wasn't pointing in the right direction. So you could say that all our technology is also limited because we need to be aware of where we're pointing it, of what we're testing. And yes, our technology can detect more things in more detail. With microscopes and telescopes, we can see things closer or much smaller than we expect, and therefore able to get far more detail. With microphones, we can actually keep recordings of things, and also hear things that otherwise wouldn't be there here at all, like bats, whales, or even, if you want, a maggot munching on a biscuit. Or in some cases, even registering what's happening in the body through ultrasounds. Having had many echocardiograms, I know exactly what that's like. We can also use olfactory sensors, or at least chemical detectors, such as spectroscopy and other, other means, to detect the exact chemicals in something that we're smelling. So is there anything that our senses can detect that technology doesn't? I want to say in a way, in a strange way there is, and that's our sense of balance. Because if we look at even the most advanced robots, and by that I mean actual moving robots that try and walk on two legs, or try and at least get a monopodal means of transport, we have things like Asimo, incredibly advanced, but the fact that it's actually running is quite incredible. So, uh, yeah. We learn from a very young age how to walk. My niece walks very well and she's nearly free. My nephew Tell him how time before he starts walking. And he's about six months. So is there any way that we can detect things that technology can't do? I would say yes. to demonstrate it in another way entirely and I'll do a I'll do a dedicated video on that when I get the time to start doing home recordings again. I've been rather busy lately. So it wouldn't at all surprise me there's something in living organisms that detects something else and that will be how God influences us some people might call an empathic sense 
able to feel what someone is well feeling. And therefore God influences that sense. Similar to how we use our or use our skin to detect heat, which is technically a form of form of light, a form of electromagnetic radiation. And that is Well, if we've already got a means of detecting that for our eyes, why don't we see heat? We don't, but we feel it in our hands, in our arms, in our skin. I'm no brain surgeon, but there's a lot going on in our heads and certainly in our bodies that we are still struggling to understand. So whilst some people might well have science on their side, might have research on their side, I would always trust those who come to a conclusion opposite to the one that they might believe in. Opposite to the classic dogma, if you will. Because they're taking their research seriously and actually trusting it. That's why I trust and respect Neil deGrasse Tyson. He doesn't necessarily lambast Christianity. That's why I respect Brian Cox, because he says that whilst there's no evidence for a creator God, there certainly is no evidence of a creator, or evidence that there isn't one. And that we shouldn't jump onto that bandwagon saying, oh, because there's, there's no evidence, then clearly doesn't exist. No. That's not, an, that's not an astrophysicist's job. I suppose to sum up, there's more to the human experience than we can really understand. And it's often those things that we don't want to believe that tend to be the, that can sometimes be the right answers. If we are looking for those, if we are not looking for them, no, I'm saying not. Sometimes the answer that you don't want is the right one, and also happens to be the answer that you draw. Thank you, and God be with you.